God's help to inspire us to evangelize. So let's ask him again that he would help us. Father, I ask um, once again that you would um, work through this series, um, that you would spark in our hearts a, a desire and an urgency to evangelize to the lost um, that you have put in our path in our lives. Um, we need your help in this. We need your Holy Spirit to convict us, to work in us, to empower us, to bolden us, to give us the words to say, to work in the other person's heart. And uh, so we are, we can do nothing without you. So I pray that you would help me now as I uh, teach, and I pray that what I would say would be helpful, pray that you would um, use the things I'm saying uh, to further your kingdom, and uh, that you would, if there's anything here that's unhelpful, that you would just make me pass over it somehow. So I pray that you would do a work here. I love you in Jesus' name, amen. So this is week three on evangelism. Um, I hope this has been helpful. It's been helpful for me. When you have to prepare the lesson, you have to research, and basically you're preparing the lesson for yourself first, and then that's what overflows. So, so I'm convicted very much through these messages. This is week three. Last week we looked at kind of what we're dealing with out in the world. So we're, we're dealing with blind people, dead people. Um, we saw this morning, deceived people. Um, they are blind to the glory of God. They are blind to the cross. They're blind to the truthfulness of it, and the gloriousness of it. Um, they will not have it. They will not have it. And the only way they will come to have it is if God does the work in their hearts, if God shines the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. If God does that, they'll see, they'll be saved. Um, so that's what we looked at last week. And we said that that doesn't make us passive about evangelism. It makes us active because we know what God uses. He uses the gospel. He uses the word. Um, so our lives should model this book, should model the gospel. We should speak the gospel, and God may perhaps grant repentance leading to salvation, as Hebrew said. So that's what we want to happen. And now we want to talk strategy. So we've, we've kind of done foundational work up to this point. And now we want to talk about, so, so we're each feeling now the, the responsibility that we are supposed to evangelize. Okay, we've shown it from scripture. We're all supposed to do it. And now we want to look at how do I do it? So I want to evangelize. What do I do now? And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with what you can do in your inner life, and then we're going to go to what you can do in your outer life, if, if you will. Um, so there are steps you can do to prepare for evangelism in your room before you even go out, and then there are steps you need to take when you're out in the community. So I'm going to start with us in our personal lives, and I'm going to branch out into our when we're, when we're on the streets, when we're in our Bible studies, um, and we'll end there. So that's what will happen in the next two sessions, talks on evangelism. So, practical, how do I evangelize? Where do I start? How do I get going on this? And we're going to move from inner man to outer man. So I think, let me look at my notes. I think I have six points here today. So we'll do six today, and then however many next time. So number one, what, what can we do? And the first point I have is we need to have a relationship with God. Obviously, you have to be saved. I'm not thinking that mainly. I think we all know that. What I'm talking is we need to have an ongoing walk with God in our lives or we will not evangelize. So what I'm thinking is, um, sub point one, we need to be beholding the glory of God in his word every day. 
um, you will naturally praise talk about what is beautiful to you. You will naturally talk about what you love. If you don't love God, if God is not glorious to you, the amount you're going to talk about and share Him is going to be minimalized on the scale of how much you view Him. If God is really small to you, the amount you're going to talk about Him will be really small. Right? This is, this is how humans work. Um, me being a football fan, when something exciting happens in a game, others are going to hear about it. They're, they're just going to hear about it. So, when I get a girlfriend in a couple years, others are going to hear about it. When I eat a good hamburger, you're going to hear about it. Mmm. Right? That's how humans work. That's why First Peter 2 says, if indeed you taste and see that the Lord is good. So our job, before you do anything, is to taste the most glorious being revealed in this word every day. That, that's what we need to do first. Because if we don't see him, we don't behold him in all his glory the best we can through the Holy Spirit, we're not going to talk about him. So we must fight to do this. And it's one of my favorite quotes, quotes by George Mueller. Quote, I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord, how much I might glorify the Lord, but how much, but how I might get my soul into a happy state. And how my inner man may be nourished. I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the word of God and to meditation on it. So we must do this. We must do this every day. Um, and, and this is not just true for evangelism. This is true for, for anything. I strive to be a pastor. Because I think that's what God wants me to do. And if that ever happens, it will be because God does a work in me as I read the Bible, that I behold him for all that he is, and then I proclaim him. Right? So evangelism, same thing. If we're going to evangelize, we need to see him. We won't talk about him. Or, if we don't see him for who he is, we'll try to make up stuff. Right? And we'll present a false view of God. So... We need to do this. We need to be in our words, and we need to pray that God does work on our hearts. As David prayed, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your word. Um, so we need to pray as we read our Bibles that God would open our eyes to see his glory that's revealed in this book. And we need to do it often and regularly. Evangelism is overflow. I'll never forget this in college. Evangelism is being so filled with all that God is for you in Christ that when you bump into someone on the street, you naturally just spill over gospel. You naturally just spill over God. Evangelism is just overflow. That's all it is. I mean, honestly, we shouldn't have to do much more on this talk than right here. If you want to be a good evangelist, you represent God. God... The most glorious being in the universe who became a man, which he didn't have to do at all. God could have let us all perish and still be God and completely fine without us for all eternity. But God became a man, died for us on the cross, and he will give life to our mortal bodies forever if we repent of our sins and believe in him. That's amazing. If this gripped us... We wouldn't have to do much, much other talk on this. We would just naturally go and do it. But, but we struggle as humans. We don't see things clearly. We see dimly. And you dimly, but one day we will see clearly. But right now we see dimly. So we've got to work at ourselves and strategize. So we're going to keep going. So evangelism is overflow. When you see the glory of God, you will speak of the glory of God. If you're not speaking of the glory of God probably struggling to see it. That's how I've diagnosed myself. Number two, kill sin in your life. 
Um, sin is an evangelizer killer. Um, you will not find those living in blatant sin talking about God because their relationship with God is broken. Right? Um, the guilt of sin will keep your mouth silent. That's, a, that's what it will do. The, the guilt will, it will trap you and you will not speak of God. It will steal your joy and make your mouth of praise drier than the desert. You will not evangelize because all someone else has to say when you're trying to convince them that God that they should give their whole lives to God, and they say, well, <laughs> and they point to your life, and the conversation's over. Right? If you're a fake, they're not in. Especially our culture. They've seen a lot of fake Christians, which is why Christians are now seen to be the, the dumber people, the non-intellectuals, right? The cuckoos. Because all people I've seen are these hypocritical, nose-in-the-air, legalist people. But that's, that's, that's been their picture now for a while. So, so sin will just, it'll minimize your evangelism. It will make you the kind of evangelist that says, you wouldn't want to go to church, would you? And they say no, and you say, oh, good, me either. Right? You will not speak boldly, you will speak passively. So what we should do is we should go to the cross, repent of our sin, and remove it. It is repentant, forgiven sinners who are the most talkative about their faith. Right? Is that not true? It's, it's forgiven sinners who are most talkative about their faith. It's beggars telling other beggars, I found the bread. Right? That's all it is. Um, so, so David, after he sins with Bathsheba, after he lusts after her, and not only that, but he gets her into his house, gets her pregnant, tries to cover it up and won't work. Because her husband is such a loyal man of integrity. So he has the man murdered. And then David is, Nathan comes, exposes him. And the guilt is real on David. And he expresses it in Psalm 51. And here's what he prays to God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit with me. Cast me not away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Do you see? It's repentant sinners that have the joy to call others to repent as well. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. So it's repentant, forgiven sinners who are most bold in their evangelism. He was forgiven much, forgiven much, right? We have a great message. We've all been forgiven completely of our sins. And we have that message of reconciliation. So, number one, be in the word. Behold the glory of God. Number two, put away sin in your life. It'll make you dry. Um, celebrate forgiveness in the cross. It will make you proclaim it. And number three, ponder hell, which is something we don't like to do at all. And I can attest to that. Um, so I'm not going to. I'm going to let Spurgeon do it. I read this quote probably 11 months ago, um, and I've not forgotten it. He was preaching, this is a, a Spurgeon quote, and he was preaching on the immutability of God, the, the unchangingness of God. God does not change. He does not change in his promises. He does not change in his glory. He does not change. He does not change. And, and this section of the sermon is he does not change in his, I think it was, in his warnings. That, that might have been the word he used. But here's the text, Mark 16, 16. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, he's, he's using the KGB, so whoever... Um, does not he, he that believes not shall be damned. That's the text he's using. So here's the quote from Spurgeon. My point is here, ponder hell. You must believe or be damned, saith the Bible. And mark, that threat of God is as unchangeable as God himself. And when a thousand years of hell's torments shall have passed away, you shall look on high and see written in burning letters of fire, 
he that believeth not shall be damned. And when a million ages have rolled away, and you're exhausted by your pains and agonies, you shall turn up your eye and still read, shall be damned, unchanged, unaltered. And when you shall have thought that eternity must have spun out its last thread, that every particle of that which we call eternity must have run out, you shall see it written up there still, shall be damned. O oh, terrific thought, how dare I utter it. But I must, ye must be warned, sirs, lest ye also come into this place of torment. Ye must be told rough things. Woe unto the watchman that warns not the ungodly. God is unchanging and is threatening. That's the word he used, threatening. Beware, O sinner, for it is a fearful hand to fall, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And, and again, in my mind, if, if we really get this, that would create an urgency. So I, I pray regularly that God would help my dull heart to feel the weight of these things. Um, I, mean, I mean, this is, we should not play games with this at all. So, so we need to ponder this. We need to, put, we need to feel the weight of God's glory. and We need to feel the weight of eternal punishment away from God. Um, so that's point three, ponder hell. I think there's a place for that, and I think we should do it. Point four, live out the gospel. And I'm just going to read a text in Acts. Acts 16, 25 through 34. This is when um, Paul and Silas are in prison praying and singing. And the earthquake comes. Um, it, it's just amazing. They really don't have to do anything for the jailer to be converted. So, so listen to what happened. About midnight, Paul and Silas were, sing, were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That's jail. That's just overflow. Being so filled with who God is, they're, just, they're in prison singing. <laughs> right? Um, and suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cries out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved in all your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour, washed their wounds, and he was baptized, and him and his whole family. Then he brought him up, them up into his house, set food before him, and he rejoiced along with his house, entire household that they, he had believed in God. Do you see the point? The point is we should live out the gospel I mean, that's just amazing. I, I've never really seen that. They didn't do anything. They, they were just singing praise to their God. And in the moment of crisis, when any natural person would have just bailed and he dies, they stay. They care about him. They stay right there, right? And then his, his response is, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> and they just say, believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. And his whole household does. So we need to take this seriously. Um, live out the gospel. When people are gossiping, don't participate. When the boss is gone, don't slack off with everybody. That's, that's Colossians 2, right? Um, um, servants, serve your masters. Um, not by the way of eye service, but to please the, or fearing the Lord. When someone wrongs you, don't explode. Forgive them. You've been forgiven. Forgive also. Don't cuss. I mean, I mean, even that says a lot. I had a guy come up to me just recently and said, man, I like you. You don't cuss and you still have a sense of humor and stuff. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Give the guy a ride when he calls you during the week. Forgive 70 times 7. I just touched on that. If someone takes your shirt, give them your cloak as well. If someone speaks evil of you, don't say anything in return like Jesus. Who, when he was being falsely accused, said nothing. 
And I found that in recent years that this has done most of my talking in evangelism. Simply living it out has done most of my talking. I usually find that, I mean, I'm 23, I haven't done much. But in the couple of jobs that I've had, I usually find that in about a, a month and a half to three months, there has just been created this natural respect from my coworkers about my faith. They've never really met people who actually legitimately live out their faith to the best of their ability. So, so <laughs> one girl, so, someone had mentioned to her that I was a, a Christian. And she goes, you mean he actually does this stuff? <laughs> she, she never had any, she wasn't dumb to religion either. She just never met someone who was, she had met only people who had said they were in and then just lived a, a hypocritical life. That, that's not most people No. I'll never forget what one guy said to me in high school. I will say I used to be a lot more of a, a gospel joy. I used to have a lot more joy in high school. Then I became academic, and academic seems to clog your mind a little bit if you don't do it right. <laughs> so I'm working on getting some of it back. So in high school, I was, um, I was dumb, so all I had was joy. <laughs> so anyway, I, I was... There's this guy named Charles I was working with, and we had gone through just about every religion, and he was, he, he would come in one day, I'm, I'm a Catholic, and he'd be like, what? And I would walk him through Catholicism, and by the end of the day, he decided he wasn't a Catholic anymore. And we would do this with all the religions. Um, Buddhism, and then he would list these weird stuff that he'd make up and stuff, and so, so we went through for weeks and weeks and weeks through all of these. And one day, um, I was working and he walked up and he said, you know, the one thing that you have that I don't have is joy. And I said, Charles, you need to give your life completely to the God of the Bible. And he said, I just need to do a little more reading. Um, I wish that happened to me a lot more. So we, uh, so we need to focus on living out the gospel because people haven't seen it. Um, and I'm finding that this, this will do a lot of our talking. If anything, it will create a foundation on which we can stand on in our evangelism. So, so I would encourage you guys to live out the gospel. Myself, live out the gospel. Have gospel joy. Point five, love people. And be involved with people. Um, we, we cannot evangelize if we're not involved with people. So... So if you're an introvert, you're cringing right now. <laughs> you're cringing with all your might. And even I am cringing some. We must be involved in people's lives. At some of, there are different seasons of life. So some of you, it's a lot harder right now to be involved just broadly with people. Um, and some of you, this is a perfect time for you to get out and do some radical things. Actually, maybe me, I'm single, so... Um, love people. P ponder that every human being is made in the image of God. Saved or unsaved. Every human being is made in the image of God. So get to know these God image bearers. Seven billion of them around us. Ask them questions about themselves. Be amazed that some people are garlic farmers. And they love it. Some are lawyers. Some live in igloos, still. Some live in jungles. Some are extroverts. Some are introverts. Some are tall, really tall. Some are really short. I mean, I mean humans are just, they're just amazing people because we're made in the image of God. And, and we, we need to, I think we need to ponder that and just love people in general. Just have a general love that for people that God has designed and fashioned, every single one of them. But they're created in the image of God. Um, we, we can be, we are so uptight, just naturally. We're just naturally so uptight. That person's so weird. Look at the way they dress. Look at his friend. Did he really just say that? I can't believe they would come to church like that. And then we find someone just like us, and we're like, hallelujah, best friend. Right? And we form these cliques of people that are just like us in every aspect. And we don't celebrate that 
what God has done in creation, the, the diversity, the, and, and all of it in the image of God, every human being. Um, Jesus didn't go to the well with the Samaritan woman and go, ah, Samaritan, and make a big loop around. He marched right up, sat down, initiates a conversation. She's saved. She goes, shares her testimony, is the word used in John 5. She shares her testimony with the village, and they all come and see, and an amazing thing happens. All because Jesus loved people. Um, we need to be involved in people's lives, too. So Christianity is not a, a privatized thing, um, which is which we can fall into that sometimes, making, making Christianity just a private thing. I'm going to go in my room and I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pray with all my mind, and then we go out to the world and, and we live the world and then we go back to my room and that's our spiritual time. Um, so it's not a privatized thing. Nowhere in the New Testament, especially in the New Testament, um, is Christianity is a outreach thing. We are commanded to go out to the world. Let your lights so shine before men. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they see your good works they'll glorify God. So we need to be involved in people's lives. No, we need to know the names of people around us. So you walk into work and you say, good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Caitlin. If I don't know someone at work, I fail at this sometimes too. But I usually try to go, like, if I know their name, I say, good morning, Caitlin. And then eventually we actually do have a conversation. It's like we've known each other the whole time. So that, that's a strategy, just knowing the names of people. We need to be creepy. Go to the same cashier. People usually have the same schedules. So if you're going to shop, go to the same cashier every week. Go to the same coffee shop if you're a coffee jer drinker. Go to the same restaurant. Go to events in your community. Get to know the homeless people. Um, carry a bag of granola bars so you don't, you're not having to give $100 bills away every time. Don't feel the weight of that. Give them money the first time. Give them granola bars the second time. Ask them what they need and get to know them, right? I, I really want to start working on that soon, because I drive past one on the gym every day, and I know um, my friend knows a couple, so I've been really convicted about this. It's just one chance to stop by five minutes, get to know somebody, move on your day. Um, so let's not light our, or hide our light under a basket. Let's let it shine that men would glorify God. Another way that we can love people is to love in deeds. By doing things. So 1 John 3.18, let us love not in word or talk, mainly, um, but in deed and truth. Let's do things. Love is always active. Um, in James, he's, he's making the argument that faith without works is dead. And this is his example. Faith without works is dead. If a brother or sister, sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you say to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. Without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? Do you see? So if someone's in need, and you say, so they're hungry, and they're cold, and you say, I hope you get food, and I hope you get clothing. Blessings on you, blessings on you, and, and you part ways. When you have things that you can give them, what good is that? So also, faith without works is dead. And it's the same thing with love. Which is why John said, love not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. And then also, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. The point is there that we should be helping people, meeting the needs of people um, in our lives. Right? Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. You naturally are created. You are responsible for yourself to take care of yourself, to watch out for yourself, right? To clothe yourself, to feed yourself. You have these responsibilities. So love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So love is active. Um, and this will be a, um, a foundation of our conversations about God um, people will know you love them when your love is playing out in deeds. They will know you love them. 
So, an example of this, just recently in my life, I was talking with a guy, and his beliefs are crazy. So basically, you, you, if, if you look in yourself, you will find God. Just, just look in, you, you will find God. And I don't know. So we're talking, um, he needed a ride, so I drove him in for an hour. I like to listen a lot, because if you listen a lot, they, they'll, they'll just contradict themselves all day, and then, then, then you pick your battles wisely. Um, so he's talking for an hour as we're driving. Um, and at the end of the conversation, I, I said, Cody, I, I don't think um, you're dumb. Because he had mentioned people think I'm dumb. And I'm like, I don't think you're dumb. I was like, what you say, like, I get your system. Like, I get your system. It's, um, your mind came up with it, and I understand it. It's intelligible. But I said, Ev I think everything you just said, that's how it's wrong. All of it. And two minutes later, we said, I love you. I love you. And dropped him off in my home. That was amazing to be able to do that. And the reason he knew that I did love him is because I was helping him out in an area where he was in need. And it just, it just opened. Because most people in America, if you say, you're wrong, I mean, that's just hate speech. That's just hate speech. So we can back up our evangeliz evangelism with a certain way of lifestyle to where we can be just straight up honest with people. I love you, brother. I think you're wrong. <laughs> and I think my system is right. I think you need to give your life to God. <laughs> he said, well, I think you need to do it. I was like, fair enough. <laughs> we'll talk next time. <laughs> love you, love you, bye. Right? So let's love. So that's my six points. So let's, we'll stop there. And the next time I want to get into, um, let's, let's start Bible studies one-on-one -on -one with people. Scary thought, right? So, so to hear more, come next time. <laughs> Any questions, real quick? Comments? Yeah. Do you have five points or six? Six. Do you want me to read them again? Yeah. Because I, I stopped, I stopped, I stopped with five my five clarity. Oh, no, nope, you're right, five. You did good. You did good. Wow. I have the six one here, but I'm not going to start it. Okay, that's <laughs> awesome. It's just that you said six, and I'm like, six. That's awesome. I also brought resources. I want to, uh, I forgot, I almost forgot to mention that. I printed out, I, I have those books I mentioned over there to look at. One of them is a new one, You, Me, and the Bible. If you want to start Bible study with somebody, this is just a, a, uh, a very small booklet that has a section of scripture with questions you can ask. So it's basically here, let's look at this together, and you're both looking at it. There's no like, you're both on the same level, what does the Bible say? And it's a very helpful book, so you can look through that. Um, and then I printed out a bunch of articles on evangelism that will say a lot more than I can in a couple sessions. So... Evangelism, if you're an introvert, um, reasons we don't evangelize. One's called Lord Make Me Bold. Um, so I printed out a bunch of them. So if you want to take some of those home, um, they are helpful. And they will explain things better than I can. So anything else? Questions, comments? All right.